that song never gets old to me. I love that song. Um, all right, first question, and this is something as a, uh, a lifelong uh, Lost Boys fanboy, I've always wondered, how often are you guys um, at dinner, in, in an Asian restaurant, and someone comes up to you and asks how you're enjoying your worms or your maggots? <laughs> Oddly enough, that's never happened to me. Thanks for putting it out there. <laughs> Sorry, don't do that. Please don't do that. Because um, I want to do it. Um, I, I do want to talk about the original kind of genesis of this movie, because it, it, it's so iconic as we know it, but it started out as a very different movie um, before you guys came on board. Well, I think uh, Joel Schumacher directed Lost Boys, and, uh, and it was written for much younger people. Uh, so when I was cast, I, I was actually reading a, a film that kind of reminded me of Goonies. Uh, and so which would have been a bunch of 13 year olds. And so Joel wanted to kind of shift that a bit. And so on some level, it was made on the fly. And uh, Jason had a large part to do with that, uh, was really instrumental in kind of changing, working with Joel on the script, sometimes in a nice way and sometimes not so nice. <laughs> uh, but, but he really did, he helped really shape the film. and. and uh, the one thing that I've always kind of regretted was that we were so young when we were making it that we had no idea how lucky we were to be a part of it. Um, so thank you for reminding us. Yeah, so it, it started out as kind of this, you know, Goonies was a huge hit and it started out as this kind of Goonies meets Peter Pan meets vampires idea. And then Joel comes in and makes it um, not only a lot sexier, but one of the sexiest movies ever made. Um, and then you guys come on board, but you know, these things pick up mythology over time, and, and the mythology is that you both turned it down. Is that true, and what was kind of the reason originally? Like, there was some convincing to, to get you on board. I'd have done a Camels commercial. I wasn't turning anything down. <laughs> See that? So, so I definitely did not turn it down. I was, I was thrilled to have been offered it. Yeah. I did turn it down. Yeah, okay. <laughs> There's some truth to what you read on the internet, apparently. Uh, okay, so what was it about it that finally clicked for you? Well, uh, I, didn't, I really just didn't have Cast any... me. Yeah. Because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> you were 18, you're both 18. It was, you know... 19. Yeah. 19. Um, I just didn't want to do a vampire movie and wear teeth and fly around and do all that kind of stuff. So, but I met with Joel, he's very persistent and... and like Kiefer said, he would have done a commercial. I should have as well, because I really didn't have any money. Yeah. But I turned it down many times. And uh, he just convinced me that he was going to make this very interesting movie and give us all a lot of involvement. And if you're 19 at the time in 1986, um, that was attractive to have some creative input in something. Yeah. And then I think, you know, one of the reasons that movie lasts today is, is, is look at the actors you have in that movie. Yeah. I mean, you have Diane Weist, who's a two-time Academy Award winner, right? I mean, you have Ed Herman, a Tony winner, you had Bernard Hughes, and then you had some, you know, young up-and-coming up pups that uh, got in there. And uh, all credit to Joel, because Joel made the, this, this he created that look, he created that soundtrack, and he let us use the best parts of ourselves to fill that out. But there wasn't a movie that was made before like that, and there hasn't been one since, really. And that's credit to him. Absolutely, yeah. Um, I do want to talk about you, you guys and, and your kind of dynamic on screen between these two characters. It's, it's this amazing balance of, of tension, uh, where you're rivals, but also you have this chemistry. Um, and this kind of kindred connection. Oh, talk about kind of finding that. Well, the, the one benefit is that we, we were friends. We became friends really quickly. And so if you start there and you work backwards, yeah. the tension is quite easy to create. I'll tell you a funny story. Uh, Jason and I had the full vampire makeup on and, and we went to go have lunch. Uh, and Off we were, the studio line. And we were tired of eating at Warner Brothers Studios, so we got in my car and we were driving uh, to a restaurant and we were stopped at a red light. And this girl pulled up and looked over and just looked at both of us and went, You're disgusting. <laughs> 
which I think made our day. Um, so it, we, we were having fun. And so when you had to create the tension and the dynamic that we didn't, you know, that there was animosity between the two of us, the fact that we were friends made that very easy yeah. to do. And I think it comes through because it really is a, a balance. It does, they never feel quite totally like enemies the entire time. Yeah. You know, there's a, an attraction to each other in a way. Um, and I want to talk about the fashion because I know for me personally, <laughs> this movie inspired my entire life. Uh, I think the fashion is extremely unique and in some ways very dated, but also very timeless. And perhaps that's just because all those things are coming back around. But how did you guys feel when you finally like kind of put on the clothes, especially for you? I mean, your outfit is... Joel Schumacher wanted my character to have white hair so that it would resemble the fact that he, he was actually dead. Yeah. Uh, and, and I had long hair at the time, and he said, I want your hair long and I want it white. And I, I dyed my hair white, and I looked like Ric Flair. I looked like a wrestler. <laughs> it was like bleach blonde. It, it was awful. And so when I got there, uh, Billy Idol had just come out and left Generation X and, and was doing his own thing, and I thought he looked really cool. And so to stay true to my word, I got the top of my hair cut like that, but I left it long in the back so that I didn't completely lie to Joel. And, uh, and then unfortunately, kind of, I think I'm probably responsible for creating the mullet. Yeah. Uh, Business in the back. So I apologize to you all for that. Uh, but the great thing about the wardrobe was, and certainly for our characters, for the, for the vampires, uh, you felt like a rock star. It yeah. was cool. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it does. And there's, I think, you know, even in the set design, in, in the cave, and it feels like this kind of very, you know, 70s rock inspired thing. And I, the thing that I think is interesting too is people don't credit this as being the first movie that kind of took that idea of vampires and their fashion being influenced by the time they came from, uh, which we of course saw, you know, much later in a lot of other vampire movies. Well, it's something that most people don't know. Joel Schumacher, the way he kind of rose through his career, uh, he was a window dresser at Bloomingdale's, and Woody Allen saw one of his displays and loved him, and he became Woody Allen's costume designer. Oh, wow. And so he was a costume designer for a long, long time. Then he wrote uh, Car Wash, and then he got his first directing gig, and by the time we worked with him, it was only his third or fourth. So he, wa he was a costume guy. Right. His, it, fashion was everything to him. Yeah. And so you're right, I don't think it was dated. I think it was very progressive. Yeah, and, for sure. Except for Jason's character. Jeans and a t-shirt. <laughs> I mean, but, you know, the thing about Joel, you know, to go with Kiefer was saying, is that, see, I don't think it's dated because I think he created that look. Yeah. These aren't, oh, that's these, a good aren't point. these girls aren't wearing high hair and, uh, you know, Cindy Lauper fluorescent leggings, right. which is dated. Yeah. I mean, he created that look. I mean, as I said, I was in jeans and a t shirt. But part of that aesthetic was he wasn't making a kid's vampire movie. I mean, he got the guy who shot Raging Bull, right. a taxi driver, to film his kid movie. Yeah. And he got you know one of the great, great, great um, production designers in Bo Welch. Yeah. So he surrounded this stuff with something much larger. And that sense, I think, there's a classic sense to it that seems to have you know remained in all these people that, that we meet. And that, and I, and gives it a timeless feel. That's true, yeah. In a way, it's kind of a time castle movie, but at the same time, you think of the fashion from that time and you think of this movie because it was so iconic and evocative of that fashion because it created it. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, we're, we're gonna take it to you guys, so if you wanna ask a question, go ahead and start lining up. I'm gonna ask one more to give you time. Um, you know, the way the movie ends off a little bit, set up, um, you know, of course we got sequels later, but originally there was supposed to be a direct sequel. How, you know, you always hear that, but how much did you guys on your side hear that that was actually in the works or a plan? Joel had talked to me about it a little bit and he wanted to do, he was toying with the idea of doing a prequel, yeah. which was going back to the great earthquake of, in San Francisco in 1919, right. uh, or 1920, uh, and then, that that's where the, the vampires through the earthquake had come out. It, it was a half an hour discussion with a bottle of wine, so uh, it never came to fruition, and I never heard about it after that. I kind of love, though, that we it just exists on its so own. You know what I mean? Especially now that we live in this time where it feels like everything has to have a sequel. It just exists as this one movie. Um, 
Uh, I'll give you guys some more time. I, I, you're, you're a music guy. I want to talk about, you know, we started out with that song. The music in the film is so iconic, and that, again, comes from Joel, you know, in excess, uh, Echo and the Bunny Men. Um, was, was music a part of it even when you guys were filming, or did that soundtrack come about much later? No, the soundtrack was something that Joel was doing on the side. Uh, I'm looking out, I can't see too many children. Um, but every, every time I hear that song, Cry Little Sister, yeah. if I, and I'll, I'll do this as delicately as possible, any time I ever went into a dancing bar, they would put that song yeah. up. And so when I heard it just now, I kept looking for the dancers. So it's, it's that, that kind of... A that's, dancing bar. A dancing bar. A dancing, a dancing bar. bar. Like a uh, gentleman's yeah. club. A dancing bar. That would just... So, so the songs actually is very funny. They would follow you around. Yeah. yeah. And then you just look over and Tim Capello is still there with his shirt off, yeah. just gyrating with a saxophone. Um, <laughs> You got to be there for that. You got to see that in person. <laughs> what was that sight like? Uh, I helped oil him up. Oh. <laughs> what an honor. And I filmed memory. it. <laughs> <laughs> filmed it. All right, I'm sure you could make a lot of money off that video, weirdly. Um, all right, let's take it out to you guys, right here. Hi. Hi, uh, my name is Cody. Uh, this is about a different movie, but what was it like working with Jack Nicholson and Tom Cruise on A Few Good Men? Well, it was extraordinary, and, and they're both incredibly different actors. Uh, and, and the one thing that is a common denominator between the two of them is how professional and well prepared they are. When I was a younger actor, I used to think, oh, that's Jack Nicholson, but he's just being Jack Nicholson. And it wasn't, wasn't until I did A Few Good Men that I realized how hard he worked to be Jack Nicholson. And a credit to that was when he did the final scene in the courtroom, uh, most of us had the day off, and every actor on that film went to watch him shoot that scene, and he did it in two takes, and the only reason he did two takes was because Rob Reiner didn't want to waste the entire day, but it was one of the only times I've ever been on a film where they had scheduled a whole day for a scene. He did two takes, and Rob Reiner said, it's not going to get better than that, we're wrapped, and we literally, it was a two-hour day. They were so professional and they were so prepared. Uh, and, and I learned an incredible amount from both of them. But, but Jack Nicholson specifically, he had, he had a, an exquisite technique in how he arrived to moments. Uh, and so it was an honor to be a part of that film. Thank you. I, I always liked your line when you said, yeah, I like all you Navy boys. Whenever we gotta go fight somewhere, y'all give us a ride. <laughs> Yeah, it's tough to, it's, there's a little bit of an echo, it's tough to hear you. Oh, sorry. Whenever you're making fun of the Navy guys, you said, y'all give us a ride? Oh, we give you a ride, yeah. Uh, there, there were certain lines in, in that that were fantastic. Uh, and to be able to be that snobby to Tom Cruise was kind of fun. <laughs> Hi. Hi, how are y'all? It's so great that y'all came to this con. We appreciate it so much. I just want to let you know that we're huge fans. We all love the 80s. If you don't, you need to go back and do it again. <laughs> uh, I just want to know for both of you, what was your very first job as a teenager? This was like your second job after Solar Babies, right? That's right. Yeah. Thanks for bringing that up. Sorry. <laughs> Solar Babies is a sore subject, I'm sorry. The first job I had was a short order cook in a restaurant called Comachino's in Toronto, Canada. I was about 14. Uh, and then I was about 16 when I got the first film I ever did was a film called The Bay Boy, uh, which was a Canadian film made by Dan Petrie who shot Fort Apache of the Bronx, Raisin in the Sun, The Dollmaker. Uh, but that was the first, first film job I ever had. Okay, well thank you so much. Thank you. Jason, what were you doing when, like, what were you just doing for life, for work, when you... Like that? Yeah. Um, before that, I did some telemarketing. Um, <laughs> I worked at McDonald's for three days. <laughs> That's a true story, three days. You were allowed, if you worked at McDonald's for an eight-hour shift, you were allowed a burger, a, a fry, this is in 1985, and a, uh, a small drink. 
And I remember they had me cleaning out the fish fryer because it had caught on fire, and, and that's true as well. And I remember just going to get a medium drink. It was very hot, I was covered in sweat. And the manager lady said, it, only a small drink. And I said, yeah, I don't want the burger and I don't want the fries. I just, you know, I'm just gonna have this. She took my drink, just poured it out in front of me like this. And that was the end of my McDonald career. <laughs> I gave her my hat and I walked right out. I can now, I watch Lost Boys in a totally different way because I see where you're pulling all that angst from. And you're like, <laughs> Really hard three days. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Um, what was your fondest memory of filming with Corey Haim? Oh. Of what? Filming with Corey What was your fondest memory of filming with Corey Haim? Oh, filming with Corey Haim. Great question. For me, uh, he had made a film with uh, Sally Field, uh, and I'm trying to remember the title of it, uh, and, and James Garner, that uh, he was just. What's that? Murphy's Romance. Murphy's Romance. And that was the first time I ever saw him. Uh, and I found that film to be so moving. And there were scenes that he had in the car with his mom that were just so open. And, and I'm, I, I always get sensitive about people that young working. When he started working, he was 11 years old. Uh, and, and both he and Corey Feldman, I worked with him on Stand By Me, uh, were just, thank you. Uh, they were just so young to be doing what they were doing and, and, and you always worry that their interests might not be being looked after. Uh, so I just, I remember Corey Ham is just so excited to be able to have this opportunity but he was also having kind of some family issues. And so I think on some level, he kind of leaned into Jason and myself because we were older, uh, about wanting to be really good in the scene, but also having fun and all of that stuff. So I, I just, there's not one specific memory. Uh, I just remember how talented he was, and, uh, and, and at such an early age. And I just don't think that that's a very easy life for a kid. And I kind of, that's, when I think about Corey, that's what I think about. Yeah. Jason, you guys had your, your brotherly chemistry feels so authentic, so. We spent a lot, a lot of time together. I mean, yeah. that was one of the things um, that I talked to Joel about because, you know, in this script, which you touched on, the scripts, and some people have had assigned scripts. There was no real script. It was a hodgepodge of ideas, and there wasn't enough of a relationship with, uh, with the brothers. But I thought, you know, the way for me that I didn't want to, one of the things that Joel convinced me, I wasn't just going to play a vampire, I was going to play a kid who's moving to a new place, who's a man, and all of a sudden has to take over for his father, and now he wants to do something else, you know, and he wants to break away. And part of that, he really had to have a good connection and believe that those were brothers, believe that that was his mother. Without any of the exhibition, it's not going to come in a movie like this. And so I spent a lot of time with him on my own, and during the filming and all that kind of stuff. So. Thank you. Thank you were talking about fashion in the movie. He has some of the best fashion in this movie. <laughs> Corey does. Hi. Uh, hello, my name's Alexis. Um, I was wondering what the most fun thing or most interesting thing to do on the set was, like in the movie or off the movie. What the most fun thing was? Yeah, like on or off set. What was the most fun thing? It seemed like a fun set. <laughs> well, I think for me, the driving to the restaurant was the most fun thing. <laughs> But a couple other things, uh, something you might not notice in the movie, uh, we did all our own motorcycle work and I was, there was a girl on the boardwalk when we were shooting one of those scenes that I really liked. <laughs> and so I was showing off and I was doing a wheelie up and down the boardwalk and I went a little far and I hit a train track and the bike went up and I went down and I broke my wrist in three places. And so, uh, a surfer, a surf maker, a surfboard maker, made me a polyurethane cast that was less than three millimeters thick. And if you notice on my bike halfway through the movie, I now have a clutch and a brake on my left side because I couldn't work the right one and that was just stuck into the, into the handlebar. And all of a sudden I had to start wearing gloves. And so I'll, a really great moment. Uh, Jamie Gertz didn't know that, and she was on the back of the bike, and she went, 
what's wrong with your hand? I said, it's broken. And she said, can you ride this thing? And I said, we'll see. <laughs> just took off and I just remember her screaming from behind me. So that was kind of fun. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day. Hi. Hi. My name is Angela. Um, the Lost Boys was a movie that, I don't know, I don't know there's kids in here. It kind of popped my cherry on vampires. <laughs> to the point that I actually have a vampire tattoo. Um, but Can we I see that? <laughs> Well, your heart. Yes. That was a lot lower than I was expecting. <laughs> not low enough. Let's not turn this into oh. a dancing bar. Now, now I'm gonna, now I'm distracted. Um, no, my, I guess question and comments are specifically to, to Kiefer. I have followed you since watching The Lost Boys through a lot of different movies. Um, probably the most brutal one being, um, well, A Time to Kill was, yeah. Um, but, my mom, my mom watches you on Designated Survivor, and absolutely, it's just, yeah, it's, I mean, and you're phenomenal, I, and I loved you in 24. I guess my biggest question is, is it more fun or more difficult to play a villain versus a good guy? Well, it's, eye for an eye, for instance, was a oh, really God. difficult part. <laughs> uh, I have kids, and, you know, to, to imagine what the worst circumstance for them would be and then play that guy is, is, is not a lot of fun. Having said that, the villains often are the most well-written characters because a writer gets to, the writer doesn't ever perceive themselves as that person, so there's a kind of freedom when they write it. Uh, and, and so, just as a reader, I've noticed that the villains are sometimes the more developed character. Uh, and that's always been a lot of fun to play. Uh, and David was a perfect example of that. Yeah. yeah, I love playing that character. Yeah, the tattoo's actually modeled after your. Name. Bless your heart. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Um, so I want to start off by saying that uh, I've been watching The Lost Boys since I was little, and y'all. You're still know. little. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well I'm 16. So, um, but both of y'all were actually one of my first crushes. So, <laughs> um, so I want to direct this question to Kiefer, but um, what was your biggest, like, your funnest, like, moment on Stand By Me? On Stand By Me? There, there were a lot of them. It was, again, Stand By Me very much like Lost Boys. I, I wish I had been older when I did it because I didn't realize how lucky I was to be a part of it. One of the things about that show that I loved so much was Rob Reiner as a director. Uh, he had eight hours to shoot with the kids and he would only shoot four hours a day with them because the first four hours he would play theater games with them to get them warmed up. And the fact that he took that kind of time uh, to work with them, I think affected all of their performances. Uh, I think one of the most enjoyable moments I had, River Phoenix was learning how to play guitar. And I played guitar and the film originally was called The Body. And I was teaching him how to play Stand By Me. Uh, which was one of the first songs I ever learned and, and it was an easy song to learn how to play and sing at the same time and so we were playing that and Rob Reiner walked by and went oh my god stand by me I love that song I haven't heard that forever and then three months later that was the title of the oh, wow! so I, li I like that moment a lot yeah that's amazing thank, thank you. you hi hi my name is Gina um, how does it feel to have other generations enjoying y'all show to this day, Lost Boys? It was a good follow-up question since she was 16. Her question was... <laughs> yeah, well, on no, since she was 16, but I made my son at five watch y'all show, and he's 26 now, so... Her question was, uh, how does it feel to kind of see that this movie is... Going is always on with different generations. With yeah. Um, you know, I mean, Kiefer and I, unless someone stops us on the street and you say thank you very much, it's only in a situation like this that you get to really see that. And we see people that have come up that are three generations of people, or people that met watching the VHS when they were in seventh grade and they're now married together. Yeah. And so, for whatever reasons, it holds a very specific part in people's childhood 
And I, you know, I'm a father, and I think we all want to share our childhood with our children. Mm -hmm. And so I guess, you know, we're fortunate that we're part of something that is being passed down to other people in that way. Yeah. Well, and it's also so nice that it's a film that parents chose to be one of the first films that they showed their children. And so, <laughs> hey, I'm yeah. that kind of mom, horror no. movies, what can I say? Oh, no, bless your heart. <laughs> Yeah. Because it's a fun film. It's, it uh, is. You know, so it, and thank you all. I think, too, it's a testament to what we were talking about, in that there's something that every generation kind of looks at the culture of their parents' generation, and all that stuff becomes cool all of a sudden. And so to be able to connect with that film and the music and the fashion and stuff, like, it's just always kind of coming back around. So, hi. 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 Uh, this is for Kate. For I'm just curious, will you and your band be touring in Texas anytime soon? Oh yeah, is your band touring? Yeah, we're, uh, in fact, we're going to be here at Billy Bob's in oh, four yeah. weeks, something like that. <laughs> and, uh, no, we had such incredible support. The record came out uh, just over a week ago. It charted top 10 in the top 10 in the UK and the top 20 here. And, and uh, we've been focused over in Europe, because that's where we were playing. Uh, but we're going to be back in the States. We're going to be uh, playing the Grand Ole Opry in about three weeks, uh, CMA Fest, which is a big deal for us. Uh, so yeah, we'll be touring all the way through till December. Okay. So hopefully we'll see you out there. Thank you. I think, I think uh, what I'm noticing is that you have fans everywhere, but we have a special love for you here as somebody who plays country music and is a cowboy in real life. So sure. you're an honorary Texan. I have that power. <laughs> Hereby grant you. Hi, sir. Questions for Mr. Sutherland. Um, I don't want to spoil it in case anybody's streaming it on Hulu. Uh, 24, is there any way that you could use your production powers to uh, change something? And maybe. <laughs> if you. Okay. If, uh, would, well, first I should ask would you even be interested in a season 10? And, it, and if so, I'm screwing this up because I'm starstruck right now. <laughs> and I don't want to spoil anything for anybody. What, are you asking if I'd be interested in doing more 24? Yes. I guess so. Yes. Uh, okay. Yeah. Sounds like a good um, question. I've learned to never say no to that one thing. Uh, you know, the joke that I'll make after eight seasons, why did we stop? How many bad days did one guy have? <laughs> uh, but the truth is, it was the gift of a lifetime for me, that character. I spent a decade of my life doing it, and I loved every minute of it. If they were to create a circumstance that I thought was exciting, then I would certainly go back and do it. Uh, I don't know if anybody's thinking about that or not, uh, but I certainly am, am not the one who is saying no or, or anything like that. It was the gift of a lifetime. Uh, and I would certainly, if the story was right, uh, would be open to doing something like that. Were you happy with the, were you happy with season nine? The way it ended? I was very happy with season nine. Uh, in all fairness, uh, I, I had actually elected for Chloe and I to die together. Uh, and for about three days, that was what we were doing. And then they said, no way. Um, so, you know, I, Whenever it ends, I do want it to have some finality. Uh, so we'll see. We'll see you what happens. You spoil it for everybody. <laughs> well, no, no, I, I haven't ruined it at all because, I, again, you're giving me way too much credit for whatever control you think I have over this. You know, at, at the end of the day, I'm a guy who just goes to work and punches in his ticket like everybody else. So it's not up to me. Um, so again, if the story is great, uh, it would be something I would be interested in doing. Yeah. All right. So. We're I want to try and get through all your questions, but we're going to have to wrap up pretty soon. So let's go, like, rapid fire. Mine's quick, um, and it is for Keeper. And I'm glad you told the story earlier about you breaking your wrist. And I've heard you say that you broke your wrist try trying to show off for a girl. So my question is, did you get a date with her? Oh. <laughs> Not even close. <laughs> I, I think, yeah, I, I think at that point I realized I was in pretty big trouble. So. Uh, no. I just bought her a Coke and she went home with me. Yes. <laughs> that sounds about right. <laughs> Thank you. Hi. Hi. 
seeing The Lost Boys as a cult classic and spanning generations has been brought up. Best dramatic roles I felt both of you did it was My Sister's Keeper for Jason and Phone Booth for Kiefer. But what do you feel coming from such a young age with The Lost Boys, do you feel is the best role that you've done in your career? My answer to that is I haven't done it yet, but, <laughs> um, but no, I've, you know, I've been incredibly fortunate. I mean, films like Young Guns and Flatliners and Lost Boys and Stanley, they, they were all, all learning experiences. For me, I, it would definitely have to be Jack Bauer, you know, and I got 10 years to work on that and it was one of the greatest learning experiences that I've ever had as an actor. Uh, instead of making the broad strokes that an actor can make from going from film to film, uh, that character forced me to kind of focus on minutia in a way that I never had thought about before. So, so I guess if you put my feet to the fire, I'll say Jack Bauer. Nice. Next. Hey guys. What about Jason? Yeah, do it. What, what's question? <laughs> uh, a, a role that you feel, yeah, favorite characters. Oh, um, he said I don't know at first. So. I mean, uh, put him on the spot. Yeah, I mean, I made, I made very different type movies right after Lost Boys. Um, I made a movie called After Dark, My Sweet, that I really liked. I did Rush, right? And, um, you know, a couple others. I mean, I think Narc's a good movie. There's uh, just a, a different, you know, try to done different genres and try to do them in different ways. It's, uh, it's Narc's a great movie. If you haven't seen Narc, you should definitely see that movie. Hi. Hey. Uh, I know you kind of touched on this when you said that you guys felt like you were too young to kind of realize the impact that you were having at the moment. Were you, did you realize how much of a kind of ensemble cast you were part of while filming that movie? And then I know Kiefer, you, you went on and, and you did Young Guns, Young Guns 2 also, which was also a huge ensemble cast. And, and also kind of the third part of that is why wasn't Jason in Young Guns 2? <laughs> I don't think he wanted to be. <laughs> You didn't turn it down. But the, thing about the, ensemble, hey. the thing about the ensemble cast, uh, yes, you're acutely aware of that because as an actor, especially at that age, you're incredibly aware of, of who you're surrounded by. And someone like Diane Weiss, Ed Herman, uh, they're just extraordinary actors. In fact, Diane Weiss did something that I thought was so cool. Uh, Joel Schumacher was directing her in a scene, she was in the phone booth. And she put the phone on her shoulder, she dialed it, put the phone on her shoulder, took her earring out, and was about to grab the phone, and Joel yelled, cut. And she went, what? what? He said, no, I thought you were having a problem with your earring. She said, no, I'm a woman, and you take your earring off to work, yeah. do the phone. She was so honest in her performance that he didn't even realize she was doing it. And, and I thought that, like, so those are the moments that you go, as a kid, I went, that's what you need to do. That's how you, and so you're learning from those people on such a level. Uh, so I was incredibly aware of the cast that, that I was surrounded by in that film, yeah. It's interesting you say that, because I really never thought about that you have the vampire ensemble, which is what everybody thinks about, but then you have the family ensemble, and it's really two different ensemble cast movies. And a very different, like, there's a family drama movie within this, vampire movie because you get the sense that the family is moving and the father's not there and yeah I never I never thought about it like that wow. you did have that moment though when uh, when they were trying to escape the cave and you said tonight and the teardrop came out of your eye that was your earring moment but tell them why there was well, a teardrop there. Uh, uh oh it's not the girl from the boardwalk this is a true story yeah this is kind of sad uh, every once in a while you get lucky and we had to wear these contacts when we were in the full vampire makeup and you could only wear them for about nine minutes and otherwise it would suck the liquid out of your eye and you could go blind and so it was a very serious thing and i was right around the eight nine minute when we were shooting that scene but it was such an ordeal to take them out that they literally had to numb your eye to put them in and take them out and so as I reached out to the flame, the light hitting the contact made the last water in my eye <laughs> fall down my face. I mean, it was just absolute luck. But, <laughs> and, 
thank you for ratting me out. So when you watch that scene, think of that. Hey, so this will kind of tie into what you were just talking about. Um, I was wondering if, I mean, both of y'all had great careers, so many wonderful characters you've played. Whenever you're getting to ready, you're starting to build a character, is there anything in particular you look for to give you that light bulb moment of this is where I need to go with them, with the character? That's a great question. Um, yeah, you just, uh, when you're reading anything, when you read a book, uh, you're doing exactly what we do. You're, you're defining for yourself what that character is uh, in, in the novel, right? And there's usually one thing that pops out first, and for me at least, I can always speak for myself, I think of it like a tree. And so whatever the most significant thing is, for instance, like Jack Bauer, there's, he's got a very strong sense of right and wrong. Whether he's correct is, is, doesn't matter. He, he has a very strong moral compass. So that would be the tree trunk, and then the branches are all the little things that you kind of color in with. Uh, so generally, it's just whatever seems to be the most kind of obvious moment of why this character is behaving a certain way that you grab onto. <laughs> I think you can only really play yourself. So I'll look at a character and I'll sort of see who I think they are and, and take strips of myself that satisfy that character. Because I think that's... You, so, and then you get to the place where it's almost like a... Uh, like a woodwind instrument where everything else and the dialogue and the people plays through that. But you find those places of yourself, those places of yourself that are, are, are scared or vain or evil or afraid and try to mine them from some place in your life and then you sequence them in that way and to me that's how I try to figure it out. These two answers are why you never want to have dinner with a group of actors. Complete <laughs> <laughs> waste of time. <laughs> All right, we're gonna, we, we only have a few minutes left, so let's go. Rapid fire, I want to get through all these last questions. Uh, first of all, I want to say I'm a huge fan of you both. Uh, Mr. Sutherland for Stand By Me, Mr. Patrick for Sleepers, of course, it's a great movie. Uh, my question is this, when you first started out in acting, when you knew this is what you wanted to do, you both come from acting families who are in the room, and when you told your parents, namely for Keith or your father, uh, were they supportive and did they give you any advice or were they like, Oh crap, don't do it. Don't do it. It's a great question. I like that. For me, I didn't really tell them. I just ran away. Uh, I was 15 years old and I took off from school and uh, I think my mother had the police looking for me for about two months and then I think she gave up. Uh, and I just, I, my dad was in the States, I was in Canada, so I called him and told him I was safe. Uh, and then just started going on auditions and I got the job as a short order cook. and. Uh, kind of found my way. So I actually never had that kind of awkward conversation of this is what I want to do. And, but what was really cool about both of my parents is that they realized very quickly how serious I was about it. And then they were very supportive. So that was kind of awesome, which I didn't expect. Um, I don't know. I just didn't talk about it. I just went out and did what, and did what I wanted. I mean, I, my dad was a writer, so I had a very good sense of material early on um, and keeping my mind open to interpretation. But don't forget, when we started, it was a sort of seismic shift in movies. Um, in the early 80s, mid 80s, all of a sudden there were John Hughes movies where kids our age were now stars of movies, not small parts of movies. Everyone's used to that now, but that was never the case. It was rare that you had a 16-year-old, 17-year-old that was a star in a movie, in case, unless it was a specific thing about some troubled kids. It was a big shift, and that's when I decided at that time I sort of knew what I was going to do and I wasn't going to go to college because I thought I'd take advantage of this time, and you know, that's really what you know, movies have become that now. So. Cool. All right, last three. You kind of asked, you kind of answered the question of because my question was, did you ever have any um, crazy events happen with the motorcycle riding, and did you do it yourself? And of course, you did say you did it yourself. Nah, I ruined that. For you. <laughs> my, my buddy, my buddy was riding around the convention center in full David over here on his Harley earlier. He's right today. there. Yeah, stand up. <laughs> Look at. I feel like he feels your pain with those contacts. He, he says, man, I, I'm 
kind of have a little trouble seeing out of these. Uh, you were talking about the contacts. The contacts, yeah. So I was laughing. So, so you kind of answered all the questions. But you see all the people here. We love you. I really just wanted to thank you guys for coming out. This is awesome. Lost Boys obviously is loved by so many. Thank you, my buddy, for inviting me out here. Thank you so much, buddy. Full day, full day. And I have to tell you, uh, it, it's funny when people come up to the table when you're signing stuff and they always feel like, oh, this must be such a drag for you, or is your hand cramping? I, I, it's, it's hard to express how nice this experience is for me and for Jason, and we've talked about it. We don't get the opportunity, working in films or television, to ever really meet an audience. And so, you guys are the reasons we get to do the thing we've loved for our whole lives. And we don't have enough thank yous for that. So, uh, thank you. You back. guys keep kicking ass. We love you. Hi. My question is for Jason. Um, Rush is one of my favorite movies, yeah. and I love it. Um, your performance was so powerful and authentic. Um, what did you do to prepare for that? That grew a beard. Yeah, grew a beard. <laughs> a lot of drugs. Um, you know, I, I was talking about this funny was, uh, about some the other day. You know, we've been around so long now, and there's been so many movies like that. But when Rush was made, there weren't movies like that, and there had never been a real drug movie like that. The only one I could think of was maybe Panic in Needle Park with Pacino. So I really didn't want to glamorize it which I think these, a lot of movies have been since. So I spent a lot of, and there was no internet back then. So I spent time with people that were in that situation and cops, and I wanted it to be realistic. I remember telling Lily Zanuck, the director, I said, look, I want to put a needle in my arm. I don't think it's ever been done before. I want people to see it. I don't want it to be sexy. I want it to really scare people and really show what happened without making a judgment about the drug wars, but just show the sort of personal carnage that comes with that. So it was not fun to do, um, because as I said, to me, you gotta play parts of yourself, so you find the parts of yourself there in that situation. But I think going to that level absolutely at that time sort of you know changed the sort of actor that I wanted to be, that's for sure. Well, I think it was Oscar. Wow. Thank Calvary. you. All right, Thank you. last question. Hey, Gabriel. Um, I'm a big fan of 24, and I know you've been in a lot of movies and shows, but what was it like to kind of change you know, gears and work on a video game, you know, namely Metal Gear Solid 5, The Phantom Pain? Like, was that any different than, like, like movie-wise or transitioning over to a game? Or? It's, it's not different in the, in the largest sense. Uh, what I love about acting, is the storytelling. What I love about music is the storytelling. What I've enjoyed about doing voiceover work is the storytelling. The particular requirements of how to do that might change a little bit, uh, but in the end, you're trying to tell a story. And so, as long as you keep it that simple in your head, uh, your ability to adjust, I, I think, becomes more fluid. Uh, what I found so interesting about the gaming world, uh, doing Metal Gears, uh, was how advanced technologically they've become. And I see in very short time where the film industry and the video game industry are going to kind of intersect. And I think very soon you're going to start watching films where you can choose the way the story's going to move. Right. Uh, so that, that part for me was really exciting. But again, with regards to acting, uh, whether you're doing the video game, a television show, or a film, the principles all still apply, so it's, it's, it's not that dynamic a shift. I see. Awesome. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, a huge round of applause for Keeper Thank you guys so much. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of Fan Expo!